Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 154, Dan Tani Interview 2, Life as a Newbie Astronaut. Last time, we floated down to the Atlantis mid-deck, over to the airlock, and across the docking module with Shannon Lucid, kicking off her six-month stay on Mir. We learned some of the quirks of how Russia trains people for spaceflight, the power of food when living in a flying tin can, and why you shouldn't try to send a watermelon to space. And if nothing else, I can say that doing this podcast taught me how to spell the name Onufarenko. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. Because today, rather than learning about spaceflight history from old documents and books, we'll be getting it straight from someone who is there. Friend of the show, astronaut Dan Tani. We first spoke to Dan about a year ago, when he told us all about his involvement with the STS-51 mission in 1993. Back then, he was working as an aerospace engineer, helping to bring the TOS upper stage to fruition. A malfunctioning spacecraft separation system added a little extra adrenaline to Tani's life back then, but it made for a great story for us. It's been a year for us, at least if you've been listening to the podcast as the episodes come out, but almost three years have passed in the narrative. During that time, Tani applied to a particularly interesting job offered by the federal government. On May 1st, 1996, he and 43 of his classmates were announced as Astronaut Group 16, later known as the Sardines. Dan was gracious enough to agree to speak with me again, so today we'll be hearing about what the experience of applying to be an astronaut is like. We'll also be learning about the day-to-day life of an astronaut early in their career, before being assigned to a mission. I later joked with some of the people on the The Space Above Us Patreon Discord chat that hopefully I have a good read on my audience, because after the fact I realized that this interview was sort of, don't talk about flying in space, tell me more about all this paperwork you filled out. But don't worry. What I've got for you today covers a wide range of topics and offers an incredible glimpse into astro life in the 1990s, including some sage advice from the great John Young. This interview is also notable because it's the first time I've ever done an interview in person, and with that comes a little note about the audio. I suspect that most folks wouldn't think twice about this, but I like to set the bar pretty high for myself, and I've got some audiophile friends who will call me out if I don't acknowledge it myself first. In an attempt to guarantee high-quality audio in an uncertain situation, I brought along three different recording devices to the interview, and they all did okay, but none of them really nailed it. The one I decided to go with should be perfectly easy to understand, but between our distance from the microphone and a slightly echoey room, it won't have the same sound quality as my usual at-home setup. Oh well, now I know better. Maybe lavalier microphones next time. I also want to mention that if this interview sounds a little raw, you're right. I had a few people comment on my first interview with Dan, saying that I could have tightened it up a bit with some judicious editing. This is just my personal preference, but I actually like having an interview that has as few edits as possible, even if that means it's a little rough around the edges. It makes it feel more authentic, because, well, it is. So you're pretty much just going to be a fly on the wall for our entire conversation. And now that I've drawn far more attention to minor audio issues than they really deserve, let's get on with the interview, and remember why I usually read from a script. Oh, and before I play the interview, one more quick disclaimer. There's not really anything that warrants having a disclaimer, but since Tanya and I both work for NASA, him directly and me through a contractor, I'll mention that neither of us are speaking in an official capacity, and we're just speaking for ourselves, not our employers. Okay, here we go. All right, so... Let's start off basically, like, I mean, you've heard how I introduce people on the show, so, mm-hmm. like, what was your kind of education background, and, like, you know, you know, did you, went to the U.S. Naval Academy, and right. said, so, like, you know, what was, what, how'd you get into that path? Sure. Uh, so, I'm a product of uh, public schools mm-hmm. in uh, the suburbs of Chicago, and uh, elementary school, junior high, and high school, and I uh, graduated high school thinking I would study math, and uh, went to the University of Chicago, um, and uh, started uh, studying math, and boy, it got hard really fast. <laughs> so um, uh, at Chicago, my first year of Chicago, I had a guy who lived on my floor. He transferred from MIT. I'd heard about MIT, and I knew its reputation, but never it, it was just never something that I considered. Yeah. Um, but talking to him, uh, especially about engineering, and I don't, it's hard for me to believe that I made it to 19 years old and really hadn't 
didn't really understand about what engineering was. Same. And uh, and so got turned on by the idea of building stuff. And and uh, uh, University of Chicago is a great theoretical place, but does not have an engineering uh, degree. So thought I should. It sounds like that's really what I want to do. So applied to MIT um, and uh, uh, got accepted. So transferred to MIT. Uh, actually, after two years at Chicago, and uh, started mechanical engineering because I get how things move and I get forces. Uh, that's that is easier for me than stuff I can't see, like chemicals or electrons, stuff like that. Interesting. So, uh, really enjoyed it because there's a design aspect, and you get to build stuff, and you get to learn how tools work, and um, and so uh, mechanical engineering degree. Uh, my real passion uh, was kind of is, continues to be, consumer products or, or things that people interact with and the way they are designed. Hmm. So really thought that I would come out and uh, design stuff, toaster ovens and pens, and <clears throat> you know, stuff with a human interface. Right. Uh, but one of the things you do, uh, at, at, least, at least at MIT, your senior year, is you look at the people that are interviewing for jobs and you find out where you'd like to go take a trip. Hmm. And... Um, so you do a, ge- a geography-based interview strategy, and there is a company, Hughes Aircraft, that was coming to town, and they're in Los Angeles. And uh, I remember uh, uh, leaving, this is right during spring break, leaving Boston in a snowstorm and landing in Los Angeles. It was 75 degrees. Oh, wow. And uh, spending the day after my interview at the beach thinking, you know, I could probably do this. Yeah, um, yeah. And I was at at that point still wondering whether I'm going to go to grad school or get a job. So I got a job offer at uh, the the old Hughes Aircraft uh, Company in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, they used to be one of these big, giant manufacturers of satellites. Yeah. And uh, joined them. So really joined aerospace, um, uh, not out of any true love for space. I mean, I thought it was really cool. and I liked things that go high and stuff. But... um, but that's that's how I got into the space industry. Uh, while I was there, they had Hughes had the misfortune of having a stranded satellite in orbit, mm-hmm. the LeSat oh. uh, s- satellite in orbit, and I worked for the. I just happened to work for the de- department that was tasked for building the tools uh, and stuff for the astronauts to go uh, salvage the satellite, right. and so got to uh, build some tools. Got to meet the astronauts, they came out, and it was a big deal when they came out. And um, that's the first time I met some astronauts. And uh, again, you, you would think you would this would occur to you before you're 20-something years old, but they're just people, and, yeah. uh, you know, they have a great job, and they, but they're, they're, you know, they're fun to hang around with and look, hear their stories. And that was a light bulb moment where I thought, well, that's pretty, you know, they're, they have this great job, it's... Uh, uh, it's not impossible that I could get the same job, but right. still really never pursued it as a, as a thought. But that was, I remember that being a moment where I remember thinking, wow, these are just real people that, you know, had another job and then got lucky enough to get this job. So this wasn't like a childhood dream kind of situation. No, not at all. No, I say that, uh, you know, I, I liked rockets. I yeah. built model rockets and stuff, but, uh, never had any, um, and, and I, and I also, you know, I was uh, nine years old. Uh, when we landed on the moon, eight years old, when we landed on the moon, and and uh, everybody was playing astronaut. So sure. we were all pretending to be astronauts, but but as a as a real uh, career goal, uh, absolutely not. So yeah, so then let's see. I went back. Uh, um, I went back to grad school, and then thought I had left aerospace engineering, and uh, got a call from my old boss at Hughes. He had joined a little company I'd never heard of. Um, in Virginia, and he asked me to come to an interview, and I said no. And he said, "Well, come on down, and I'll just, you know, we can have lunch." And so, uh, a couple months later, I joined this startup called Orbital Sciences uh, that you know uh, nobody had known anything about at that time. And uh, when I left, I was really impressed, and I thought, I really, I remember thinking, I wonder what the hundredth employee at TRW is doing right now. Now, at that time, TRW was a huge aerospace giant. Sure, they're yeah. not anymore. Right, but but. Uh, but that was the impression I was going to get. The, the impression was that, they, that this Orbital Sciences Corporation was going to be significant, and it would be good to get in the in the uh, in the starting gate there. And it, it's turned out to be true. They've done very, very well. 
And so I joined them and got back into aerospace and um, uh, met more astronauts, of course, yeah. uh, in that job. Because that, that uh, was the STS-51. Uh, right. That was the TOS, the transfer orbit stage on STS-51. That was my, the first uh, uh, mission and first project that I worked on. The TOS was the first product that Orbital Sciences, um, it was the reason they were created. Right. And uh, so I got to work with them, and, and that's how I got. Uh, and then uh, and during that time, they started taking applications for the SNR program, uh, as they do every couple of years. Yeah. Made a call for applications and uh, filled it out and uh, just got lucky. All right. So that's sort of my uh, uh, surreptitious path, yeah. uh, or circuitous path, I should say, to, to uh, getting the uh, best job in the world. I think that's super interesting, though. Like, I think it's you know almost more interesting that you see some of these people who like are very laser focused on this one goal. <clears throat> I think it's cool that you kind of discovered it along the way and went, "Hey, this is interesting." It took a step. Hey, this is also interesting. It take a step, and all of a sudden you're getting strapped into a space right, shuttle. That, that's how it felt, <laughs> right? And I'm always impressed that there are people that knew they wanted to be an astronaut when they were six years old that became an astronaut because yeah. it's so hard. There, there are a million reasons. There are a million off ramps to that path. And uh, to know which one to take at the right time or get lucky enough, I, I would say, of course. Um, and when I talk to kids now who want to be astronauts, you, you, you tell them it's it's a great job and it's a great goal. Don't don't uh, don't count on it because it's there's so much that's out of your control. Yeah. But the things that are in your control are more things that uh, can um, take you out of the, the game. I mean, there are decisions that you can make that will eliminate astronaut as a choice. Uh, even when you're 15 years old or, or, or 20 years old. And so you got to make sure to make the right decisions and not get into trouble and not do the stupid things. Um, yeah. And maybe. stay on a good path. Like you said, you know, astronauts are just people, so you don't have to be like the literal Eagle Scout track, but like also it's like, hey, you got to have a certain amount of having your stuff together. Here. Right. Yeah, no, exactly right. Right. Uh, but yeah, that's really interesting because like you're right, you could be – you know, totally perfect, but you got to be lucky at the same time. I think about, like, in the early days, I forget which round it was, but they got more applicants than they expected, so they just divided it into three groups, and they liked so many in the first group, they just, like, dumped the entire third group without even telling them. <laughs> and I think some people came back and applied again, but it was still like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, so I've been on the other side of the selection process. I've been on the selection committee, and uh, it's overwhelming, the, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of applicants, and you know you're going to hire a dozen or so. Yeah. And uh, and it's and all and to be honest with you, those applications are outstanding. They're all outstanding. Yeah. And uh, so it's hard to it's hard to uh, narrow it down. And I'm sure there's a great deal great deal of luck. But also, what's the agency looking for at that time? Yeah. You may have a great specialty. Be, you may be the, the geologist, but the agency might not need geologists. For the, for the foreseeable future or whatever. Yeah. And so it just, it, or they may, that may be exactly what they're looking for. So uh, that's, that. you're right. There's a great deal of um, uh, luck. That's how it's Yeah, it's kind of like when um, <laughs> when they shifted over to the shuttle, all of a sudden, you know, the pilots, it's like, okay, well, there's two pilots or two people flying the right. thing for each flight. Right. And there's five in the back. So, right. like, which side <laughs> right. are you going to be on and increase yeah. your chances? And yeah. all of a sudden, that completely flipped around. Right. So. No, you're right. And now... I guess we're still hiring pilots. The NASA is still hiring pilots. You still have a pilot sort of person in the capsule, yeah. but it's uh, the skill set is not what you think of as traditional hand hand and stick for sure. Stick and rudder pilot you know? for sure. Uh, all right. Well, so I guess you know, as you know, we like to get into the you know. I've described one thing I like to do on the podcast is don't tell me you land on the moon. Tell me what buttons you hit and what order and why. <laughs> so. Right. Well, how did you apply to become an astronaut? Uh -huh. you, know, you know, what is the physical process like? Did you call someone? Yeah. Did you have to get the mail, or how does it work? Uh, so, um, uh, as I said, we were we were sitting in the bullpen, the engineering bullpen. We were out, we were at the Kennedy Space Center. We were TDY, all TDY. We lived in uh, we were our office was here in Virginia, but you know, six of us had moved down there because we were building this thing, mm -hmm. integrating it at at the Cape. And so we were sitting in our bullpen, and, and somebody said, hey, they're, they just put a poster on the bulletin board, a literal bulletin board, uh, that said they're looking for uh, astronauts to do an astronaut selection. And uh, we looked at each other and laughed about, like, wouldn't that be cool? Did you rip right. a little tag off the bottom? <laughs> yeah, no, like, call this number? No, but um, but we did call information and uh, from that phone in our cubicle and to get the Johnson Space Flight Center the general information number, called them, asked for the astronaut selection office, uh, talked to somebody there and said, hey, can you f mail four applications out? Because 
at that time it just it was uh, paper that was mailed to you. There was no downloading or anything. Right. Yeah. And so uh, they mailed four uh, four applications out. We spent you know a group of the the four of us guys spent you know a couple of days filling them out. And uh, I remember it was due on July first. I remember FedExing it to them because uh, you know because why 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 do something early when you can procrastinate and do it at the last minute? <laughs> Don't <laughs> and, tell uh, me that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, duh, but I remember having to FedEx it out and uh, and got it there on time. And so uh, so it's a it's the SS it's the SF one seventy one. It's the same uh, government application you fill out if you want to be a postal worker or FBI agent or whatever, anything working for the government. Mm-hmm. There were a few um, um, specific, astronaut specific sheets, but it was mainly medical right. It was and flying. So what's your flying experience? And then what's your medical, basically, history? And uh, so pretty simple uh, application, you know, what are your last three jobs, responsibilities, stuff like that. Uh, it is it is funny they ask you what uh, what salary you would be expecting if you were going to be an astronaut so you know you think you know it, it's ba- you know you basically you don't want to say free yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? you don't want to be too high right. you know it, it, it's easy to overthink i don't think anybody looks at that but it, it is a funny number that you have to to write in there yeah huh. so uh kind of a game theory problem there. <laughs> right yeah right so um so we you send it in physically back then. This is 1993. Mm-hmm. So you fill it out uh, on the typewriter, nice. and then you um, uh, send it in uh, U.S. Mail or FedEx that time, and then you wait. And uh, that's in July. Uh, that was that was 93. They were going to do a selection in uh, for a class of 94. And they ended up not doing a selection that year, so then they put the selection off for a year. And so a year later, uh, I got a card that said, um, uh, we are rerunning the uh, selection, so here's a blank application. Please fill in any updates from your last um, a- application. Just so do, it, do it again. <laughs> filled a few out. It was actually just the deltas, so okay. just the changes. So filled a few out, had a few more flight hours or something, and and sent it in again in July, and then uh, had heard nothing, heard nothing, and uh, had heard rumors that the selection's going to be made, and so they did a, announce a class in '95, mm-hmm. the class of '95, and then um, I think I had to call, or I can't remember if I got the card, but basically, uh, thank you very much, but no thank you. Oh, I did get a. I did get a request to go get a class three physical, an FAA physical. Um, I didn't realize where that put me in the process. I knew that they, they weren't going to give everybody $75 to go get a physical, but, sure. but, but, uh, but they paid me $75 to go get a physical. So I figured that put me at some level of selection. Uh, I found out much later that, that, uh, yeah, I did, I did well to get that far. Um, like, and then do they give you any sort of feedback on like, Hey, I guess that you can answer that, but like, hey, you are close, or like, hey, why don't you maybe apply again next time, or is it just like, hey, thanks? Yeah, no, it, uh, zero feedback, uh, zero feedback. In fact, you just get a. First of all, you, you, my memory is that I saw the press release that they announced the class in '95, and then I got a letter that said, yeah. no, th- yeah, thank you, 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 you've not not been selected, or. Um, and then, but then they turned around and did another selection the very next, the very same year. So they started another selection. They announced a class of 95. They started another selection. They were going to do a class of 96. Mm-hmm. So fill out another, send another blank application. Uh, I literally had no updates to my previous application. So I signed blank. I, I signed the bottom of blank uh, application forms because I had no deltas. Sent it back in. And again, I bought you know, I, I really had no hopes, um, and then got the but but did get a request to get another physical, so scheduled that up, and um, uh, I remember the, the the physical was early October, and I was uh, it was at three in the afternoon or something, and the phone rang at I don't know eleven in the morning, and uh, she said, "Hey, this is Teresa from the astronaut selection office." I said, "Hey, I, I'm just about to get the physical; it's scheduled today." And she goes, no, that's okay. Uh, I know it's coming, but I want to know if you'd like to come down and interview for the position. 
And uh, so I said the stupidest thing that you can say, which is, well, hold on. Let me look at my calendar. <laughs> I'm getting my, getting my, you know, the old paper calendar out. And as I'm getting it out, I'm thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. So there's only one. Turns out, yeah, no <laughs> yeah, problem. Oh, yeah, there's no problem. That's a nice, clear week. <laughs> so uh, I went down the last week in October uh, to, uh, to interview. And so uh, then now the machine is just, uh, you know, rolling. I mean, I mean now, now the train's leaving the station. You jump on and you, you hold on, right? You, yeah. Uh, and I think what was really valuable for me, I think, in my opinion, um, is that I didn't have a lot of time to, A, research what was supposed to happen in the astronaut interview um, or worry about it. So you couldn't really metagame it. You know, you just kind of went to it. Yeah, I didn't have the opportunity. There was just no time. I, there was pre, pre-internet, pre-internet everywhere. Yeah. Right. And so it certainly wasn't as easy Googling, you know, astronaut interview. Um, I had a friend. I, I worked used to work with Janice Voss and... Uh, she got selected in 92, and so I called Janice, and I said, hey, I got the interview, and I got a little bit of advice from her. And um, But it was, I think, a benefit to me to, to go into the interview week pretty cold, not yeah. knowing too much about what it was going to be like, because I think you could really overthink it yeah, um, and, and get stressed out about it and over-prepare. It's one of those things I think you could really over-prepare. So I uh, flew down. It's a week. At, so this is uh, early 90s. Uh, it's changed in format now, but it used to be a one-week uh, process with 20 people uh, in your interview class uh, from Sunday uh, morning until Friday afternoon or Friday morning. And um, uh, you, you, show, you show up on Saturday night, Sunday morning, they come and pick you up, and then you see the 20 of you. In, all in one room, and you're looking around, and yeah. it's, it's really a, a fun time. Actually. Trying to size everyone up, <laughs> kind of. It's sort of. Uh, it was. It was really. First of all, you, you, mentally, you're looking at the twenty, and mentally, you're trying to figure out where you are in that twenty. Yeah, like oh, uh, no, mentally, she, everybody she looks smart. <laughs> everybody puts themselves around eighteenth or nineteenth, you yeah. know. Yeah, and uh, and then it it, it it only gets more depressing the more the better you get to know everybody because everybody's so nice and everybody's so talented, and accomplished. And, and uh, I recognized uh, one of the guys in my interview class, which was uh, amazing, Mike Massimino. He became, he, he got uh, yeah. to pick together. And Mike and I were uh, in the same lab at uh, grad school. And hmm. It was kind of weird to look across and recognize him. I kind of remembered him. And wow, yeah. We did a thing. And yeah, so, um, so anyway, that, so uh, you show up Sunday morning, uh, you get a whole bunch of medical, uh, psychological tests and standardized tests you do, spend the day doing tests. Uh, but then you get to spend the week with these 20 people, and it's really fun. And it's really, really enjoyable. Uh, I still remember virtually everybody in my interview class really well. Um, we got really lucky. In the 20, we got nine selected in my, wow. in my year. Yeah, we, yeah, we were the best represented uh, interview class. And uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a week of physicals, mainly medical physicals, physical evaluations, um, uh, a one-hour panel interview with the selection committee, uh, a couple hours with the uh, psychiatrist. Um, it's a little different now. <clears throat> Nowadays, they do more uh, some skill assessments and some coordination assessments, um, and uh, and they break the weeks into uh, they break up into two weeks so that uh, you, there's a cut. You, you go come down for a couple days, they make a cut, and then you get some some get invited for the for the second week. So you have a little bit more insight into how you're doing through the, through the process. So after the week that they, t- they tell you, okay, we'll let you know in March or April or something like that. And, uh, and you sit on your hands and you, you know, fret and you, you stay in touch with your, your friends and you, you hear some rumors. Uh, and then, um, uh, I got the call in, in April. I can't remember April 12th or something like that. And, uh, uh, I remember hearing that if you get a call from the chair of your uh, panel, which was John Young, um, you would get uh, you're in. If the call is from Dwayne Ross, who's the heads of the office, used to head the office, then you didn't get picked. Bad and news so, Dwayne. yeah. So I I picked up the phone and it was David Leitzma, who was who was uh, the chief of the. Uh, chief office at the time. Right? Yeah, actually, he was uh, chief of FCOD, which is a little higher than the. Hmm. the He's the, the chief of the astronaut's office boss. 
Gotcha. And so I'm, I pick up the phone. Hey, this is Dave Leitzma. And, and I, and I'm thinking, well, I don't know what, how to think. I don't, I don't know. I'm waiting for this call. I've been thinking about, it's not supposed to be you. Right. I've been thinking about how, what's going to happen during this call. And, uh, you know, we, they picked 35 of us that year. So there were a lot of calls to make. So they had to split up the calls. So, gotcha. um, but, uh, I remember hanging up cause see, it's, it's as, it's as classic as the stories you hear, which is they say, Hey, do you want to come and work for us down here? Yeah. And uh, you go, yes, of course. Thank you. And they go, okay, great. We'll be in touch. And you, you hang up. And uh, the word astronaut is never spoken. Yeah. Right. And so you hang up and you think, I wonder what job I just accepted. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. it, they could throw any job at me yeah. now. Yeah. And uh, I just accepted whatever job they wanted me to come down to Houston and do. And, but it is, uh, uh, it, it was a little bit of an out of body uh, moment to get that call. So. Uh, so can we take one quick step back? Sure. Um, sorry, sorry. I'm curious about, like, I mean, could you talk a little bit more about, like, what all those, you know, the psych tests and, and all that? Like, cause I, the reason I ask is just because I think a lot of people have this image of, like, from the right stuff and then stuff parodying the right stuff. Sure. Like, the kind of the Mercury days, which I understand that, like, you know, it's more involved than, like, going to, like, a normal doctor physical, but, like, it's not quite the Mercury days anymore. Right. So the 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 written exams are all those personality tests. And I think you'd probably take all of them. And it's, it's those tests that are, you know, would you rather read a book or squish a bug? Or would you rather, you know, cook soup or, you know, these things that seem, you're not sure exactly what they're looking for. And I'm, I'm, you're sure it probably puts you on some place on the matrix and you just sit down, you do them and, you know, and, and uh, I remember thinking after I was done with them that, um, there was a lot of trust questions, you know, and, and a lot of, uh, I, I guess I remember taking it and thinking, uh, I think they want to know here, do you basically believe that everybody's trustworthy um, or people are not trustworthy? I remember coming away thinking that was one of these metrics that one of these, they, they put you on some scale uh, there. Um, okay, so, so those are the written tests. Um, and then uh, the medical tests are, Almost anything you can imagine. Echocardiogram, where they sonogram your heart. Uh, uh, EKG, they do an abdominal ultrasound. So it's all medical. But really, they you go into some room, you take off your clothes. They do something to you for you know half an hour with some machine. And then you go put your clothes back on, go to another room, do the same thing uh, over and over again. So it's like every medical test you've ever had, but in one day. <laughs> yes, in, in three days, right, on a schedule. That, and you have to be here or there. Um, there are the the one thing that I'd heard about uh, that that we got was they zip you up in a little bag and they sit you there for twenty minutes. Um, it's a claustrophobia screen, um, but it's a opportunity to take a nap. Yeah, it was that really great. It was, yeah, it was it was uh, it was hard to stay awake uh, because you're so exhausted from the from the week. There was zero, none of the spin you around. Um, stress you uh testing at that time i i don't think they do any anything like that now but so there was none of the um yeah bring you to altitude in a chamber there was none of the um uh again you know that that three axis yeah. spinning around or, or centrifuge no, none of that um that's interesting yeah they don't do that uh that's not i, I think they found that uh you know, your ability to withstand spinning uh, in three axis and then throwing up or not throwing up has no dwelling whatsoever how you're going to do with zero G. Yeah. I, I think that's that's where they've come to that. Yeah. Because I remember I'm reading that, like, you know, it was, like, especially as they were really trying to nail down what it was, they were just surprised. It's like, we've got this, like, test pilot who's, a, like you know, like, can do anything to right. him on the ground. And he's, like, sick out of his mind up <clears throat> right. there. Whereas, like, you know, someone who just, you know, like, you know, lap someone in a lab, yep. no problem. So Right. Yeah, I think uh, my memory, when I was there at least, was there was no correlation between uh, motion sickness and space sickness. Hmm. And it was not predictive how well you're going to do some, so something. No need well, to shake you up. <laughs> no, there's no needs, right? So if you're not going to, if there's no correlation, then if it's just uh, luck plus, almost everybody, even if you're really sick on day one, it feels great on day three. So right, um, right. people, people uh, get through it. Um, let's see. Any, I'm trying to think of other things that, uh, that happened that week that are, that are um, of interest. The, 
you know, it's the panel interview is the, the, the high, high stress moment of the week. And, uh, you go in and it's, uh, 12 people or so, 10 of them are astronauts generally, um, people, you know, fantastically famous people that you knew, you know, I was honored to have John Young chair my panel and, and, uh, other astronauts that I'd, I'd heard of. And then, um, and it's a conversation that you have with them and, and it starts, uh, just like, just tell me a story. And, and, uh, it was, uh, simple in the fact that it was a conversation and, yeah. and, uh, stressful in the fact that you realize that this is your only opportunity. This is your big opportunity yeah. to, um, to show them who you are and what's important to you. Yeah. I guess you can speak to this on the other side, but it seemed to me like that part is always like, you know, we know all of your numbers, we know right. all of your background, but like, we're going to try to just get a sense of like what's going on in your head just by kind of poking at you a little bit. And that's, that's your opportunity to show what's in your head, I guess. Yeah, kind of. I think it's, you know, I'm going to say it's, I would, it was my experience. I'll just speak, speak for me. It was sure. my experience that it was more like speed dating. Mm-hmm. You have an hour. You're going to, you're going to meet this person. You're going to come away from that. You're going to come away because everybody at that point, if you've gotten the interview, you are fully qualified in terms of, you know, you pay your accomplishments and what you look like on paper. And the question is, can I sit with this person for uh, 15 hours flying to Moscow? Can I live with them? In a, in a in a in an apartment for eight weeks in you know Germany while we go through training, or can I live with this person for you know six months or ten months, whatever, in a tin can orbiting the Earth? And so there's this hard to define and or or, or hard to tailor personality type or you know ease of you know, somebody that can, you can get along with easily and would be enjoyable to work with. And that's this intangible that's really difficult. It's difficult to describe. It's difficult to change. So, you know, you can tell when people are trying to put it on. And I'd say it's a lot like dating. You, some, some, it, something clicks in, 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 in you, uh, when you when you're interviewing that person and you know, you have a great conversation or you learn something funny or you learn something interesting or, um, and so that's the, it, this one hour conversation allows that, that to come out. And, uh, yeah, you get to learn about what makes them tick and what's important to them. And, um, but more importantly, you just sort of what, what, what are they like? And, you know, is that, is that what I'm looking for? And then we can talk about it as a panel. Is that what we're looking for? Interesting. Wow. That's really yeah. interesting. But I think, you know what? I think every job interview is like that. Yeah. It's just that this is a high, this is, you know, very high profile, very high stress. And so, but I think that, and, and the astronaut office has the, uh, has the, uh, benefit of having a zillion applicants. So, yeah. you know, we can be really choosy. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, most job interviews are like that. You, you, your resume gets you in the door. Uh, and then, you know, the ability for you to fit in or, be part of a team uh, that's interviewing uh, you is probably what gets you selected. Cool. All right. So you now you've gotten the call for uh, that, like, hey, you're coming down to work for Houston. Uh, work right. in Houston. Right. Like, you know, what happens next? I mean, obviously you moved to Houston, but like, how do you actually? What is like the first <laughs> few days on the job like? Yeah. So um, let's see. In my case, I went down, uh, you know, a month before or so to start looking for a place to live. Maybe it's a couple months. And so while you're down there, um, uh, you meet with a realtor and you start looking for houses. Sure, like yeah. That. But while you're down there, they schedule it out for some other things. And so there are these things that uh, as a civilian or as a, as a non-astronaut, you, 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 you just find them interesting. So I had to go get my feet measured because hmm. one of the things they start is they're going to make you a custom-made set of flight boots for flying T-38. All right. You get a custom made set, so they come and they trace your feet, and you <laughs> right, and you you do the thing, uh, and then they uh, they measure you for flight suits, right? So you're going to get a flight suit, but that's just uh, basic measurements. They don't tailor or custom make uh, flight suits for you. Um, and uh, oh, they get a measurement uh, because they're going to get a helmet for you. You're going to you're going to go down. You're going to fly T38. So that's the first thing you're going to learn how to do is fly air, these airplanes. And so you need all the 
personal equipment for that. So right, you, right. So you get a helmet, you get your flight flight boots and all that stuff. Um, and so uh, that's the stuff that gets done ahead of time. And then you come down and it's your first day. You go to the, you go and you go to building one. And the first thing they do is swear you in. If you're not already a federal employee, you get right, sworn you, in. Right, you were becoming a federal employee. Yeah, that right. Been already. So that's my day, first day of becoming a federal employee. So you have to get sworn in. Wow. To, you have to take the oath as a, every uh, federal employee must. And uh, uh, so half of us were not, or were not, we're new to the federal government, and so, uh, you know, we, we got sworn in. And then it's, uh, it's sort of a first week of job, I'm going to say fairly typical, that has an orientation for a group of people that are coming in. Um, and so you do, you know, you get, here's how to fill out an expense report, here's where the cafeteria is, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the group of, oh, I was just say the night before our first day, we got together as a class for the first time, got to meet each other, um, nice. met at one of the one of the guys' houses. He hosted um, all of us over there, and it was fun to fun to walk in this room. And <laughs> it's a big party. <laughs> we see these people. We've gotten pictures before. We, we all, everybody's got the press release, and we got pictures, but but uh, hadn't met each other, and and. Uh, it was a, a moment like maybe your freshman year in college where you show up and you see these people and you, you realize these are going to be important people in your life. And uh, this is the first time you get to meet them. And I, I remember uh, that. And uh, and then so <clears throat> now you're a group. Now you're a class. There's a class leader. Somebody is selected as a class leader. And, and so you meet every day as a class and you start working the logistics of how you're going to work as a class. And, you know, um, just like any other group of a class of 35 people, actually we're 44 people because we had nine internationals with us. And uh, so it's a big group, lots of logistics. Who's going to, you know, get a calling tree back, you know, back then because you needed a calling tree and oh, yeah. who's going to do this, who's going to do that. Um, and uh, I, my, the first week was just uh, orientation. Here's, here's how to, here's how to work at the Johnson Space Flight Center. Interesting. And then uh, pretty soon you start doing trips because uh, one of the things you do is ask hands, or called ask hands, actually not candidates. One of the things you do is ask hands is go visit all the NASA centers, get to know, get to see, and, and be at all the NASA centers. And um, uh, you pay homage to the centers, and they get to they get to get the pictures of the astronauts coming through. Oh yeah. And um, so it's 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 called ask hand training. You're just learning at that time. You learn everything you can about the shuttle, uh, about how NASA works. A little bit about station at that time, and uh, they start putting you in sims pretty soon uh, because there's uh, they they NASA Johnson Space Flight Center needs the astronauts to do these things like uh, staff sims uh, simulations, right? They need crews to sit in the shuttle and sit in the in the in the station to do uh, mission simulations. Right. So, yeah. So that um, uh, so that's important, and then uh, probably the most important thing you do is an ask hand class when you once because we start in usually starting in August, late August, early September. Um, uh, biggest thing that on your docket is to uh, the ask hands uh, have to provide the entertainment at the Christmas lunch, huh? And it becomes clear to you soon on, uh, pretty soon, that uh, that's a big responsibility. The previous class has been waiting for you to show up, so they don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> And uh, and so you provide an hour of entertainment at the Christmas lunch. I assume this is still tradition, and uh, and you have to strike the right balance of uh, irreverence, yeah. uh, but uh, but you can't cross the line, right? right? So you 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 try to you, you figure out who you can insult gently <laughs> and who you can't, so. um, and it's fun. It is fun, and uh, um, but that is a responsibility you have until until the new class comes along. And uh, uh, so you start worrying about that pretty soon, pretty it's pretty soon in. Early test. <laughs> yeah, it's an early test. It's right. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, you know, I know that especially like uh, as an ASCAN, you would go through you know, learning all about the basics of all this stuff. Do they ever talk at all about like the history of that? Like, would you learn about lessons learned or stuff from like Gemini or they just like, you know, be like, hey, listen, we've we applied that, you know, you'll get that inherent through, through shuttle training. I'm just kind of curious about like an, a an average astronaut going into this. Will they come out knowing much about like you know stuff like on Gemini Nine A? You know, not no, certainly not to that level. Yeah. Certainly not to the level of uh, of the missions. And 
it, I, I, just because of the kid, way I was raised, I knew all about the Mercury and Gemini. I knew about human space flight because I was sort of that kid. Yeah. I think there were people that were, became astronauts that had no his, no knowledge of history. I don't know how they learned yeah. uh, because we did not get specific uh, knowledge, uh, specific lectures or anything about it. We did have uh, speakers. Um, Al Bean oh, came yeah. and talked to us. And uh, but he talked more about painting than about going to the moon. Um, but uh, but he did talk to us. So you, you get these little history lessons by by seeing the real the real deal. Gene Kranz actually came and talked to us, um, uh, and um, we it was amazing. We got Neil Armstrong to come. Wow. He was here for some other reason, but he came and spoke to our class, and uh, that was that was something else too. So we got a lot of the history. Um, from the stories of the people that were uh, invited to talk to us that were, uh, and that was fantastic. That's a good way to get that history. <laughs> yeah. Plus, I mean, I was, I have, I was lucky enough to be there when John Young was in the office. Yeah. And so, I mean, he, John's so famous for, uh, for, uh, the stories he tells in irreverent ways, but he'll, uh, you know, and that boy, there's one guy who, when he was walking around, he was Gemini, he was Apollo, he was shuttle. And, uh, and a story would come out about, you know, ah, Gemini eight, I was blah, blah, blah. And you, and you think, wow, this is, you know, firsthand account of, uh, of what happened. And, um, uh, so, you know, we, we, I think all of us were smart enough to get our history, uh, about John, uh, so that we knew, you know, the basics of his flight. And, yeah. Uh, and so when he came out with a story, it was relatable to us or we understood what was going on. Actually, that's perfect. One of the things I was specifically wanted to ask about was if you ever had any notable John Young moments. Since I, since I know a number of astronauts have had that, that moment of like, oh, no. <laughs> um, I like John a lot. Uh, I had the privilege of flying T-38 with him uh, several times. I went to the Cape with him. He He used to love to go to the Cape just for two hours walk around the uh the uh, omb uh, just to kick the tires and talk to pe- talk to folks he, scare everybody <laughs> well he was great i mean it was really amazing you know you're here's these guys that are gluing tiles onto the bottom of the shuttle and here comes john young just wants to say hi how yeah. you doing and find out how things are he was he understood the value that he had to the workforce morale and he, he took his job he took that responsibility seriously i really respect that you know his just to walk around and shake hands and and uh, and be Mister uh, Mister Shuttle uh, there, but uh, but my favorite saying he had two sayings. One was uh, one was uh, uh, never pass up an opportunity to go to the bathroom because you never know when the next one's going to be. So I always think that's John. And, oh, you know, hey, hey Johnny, you want to you mind if I hit the head? Nope, of course. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta <laughs> never pass up an opportunity to go to the bathroom. Um, and the other is uh, somebody would say Captain Young. Uh, did you walk on the moon? He goes, Nope. I worked on the moon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I really like that. But, uh, I, I don't have any specific stories other than, I mean, I just remember him in Monday morning meetings. Uh, uh, he would sit quietly for an hour and then the chief of the office would go around the room getting any last comments. And, uh, John Young would be the last person you, he would ask. And so he, he'd go around and then, then chief of the office, he him or her, Say, Captain Young, you have anything you want to add? And uh, John would just stand up. He's got his notes, and he go, right, "I'm just a stupid pilot, but you know, I don't know much about this yeah, and yeah, that." Yeah, right. right. And then he would come out with some uh, either uh, some incendiary remark about uh, something, or about about some design that he thought was stupid, or or something, or some really insightful thing that nobody had uh, thought about, um, uh, or some aspect of uh, it is generally safety related, some flight safety thing that. That he had been uh, thinking about, just waiting for the time to, to for to get the uh, to get the floor. Um, he was great. I uh, he was uh, he was the astronaut's astronaut. Everybody everybody respected him. I I uh, I think he was everybody's hero there. I, I think I've mentioned this quote on the show. But my favorite John Young quote was um, when some technician was asking him, like you know, how he wanted something displayed on the um, the orbiter displays during an RTLS abort. And he said, "It doesn't matter because if we're doing an RTLS abort, I'm going to be covering my face and screaming." <laughs> <laughs> There's the the, the movie uh, uh, it was the one before Dream is Alive, um, uh, Hail Columbia. Yeah, yeah, all about the first STS one. And there's a there's a uh, a scene where it's, it's a press conference, and uh, it's John and Crip, 
uh, sitting at the table and a million reporters. And uh, somebody looks at him and says, uh, uh, Captain Young, uh, do, do you think it's going to, how do you think it'll work if you have to use the, the uh, ejection seats? Because, right. right, you had these ejection seats in, in the, on the shuttle, which had to, it, it, which I don't know the details of, but of course you have to create a hole in the cockpit above yeah. you all the wires and all the panels. So that had to go. I don't know how that worked. Yeah. And then, sh- and then seats that are going to come out of the thing. But you could tell that John was livid. He just was, he was, you could tell he was really angry about having to answer this uh, question about the ejection seats, because I think the question was more like, you know, you know, are you going to be man enough? Or I, I don't know what the question, but, but if yeah. you see it, it's hilarious. Cause Wrong way see, to ask a question. You could see him seething, right. As, as he, as he looked at the guy and he goes, you just pull the handle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was great. No, you just pull the handle. Yeah. I'm going to, to have to check that out. That sounds great. Uh, so let's say that all right, you've gone through the, your year of ASCAN training and you're mm-hmm. full fledged astronaut, but you're not, you know, you're not in, assigned to any particular mission yet. What's kind of like a day in the life if there is a typical one? Yeah. So, uh, I, I tell people that uh, as astronauts, we are either training to fly or we are supporting our friends that are training to fly. And so the astronaut office itself has to do a lot of work and make a lot of decisions. Uh, and as an example, uh, you know, there's a tool that's being developed uh, for an EVA. And um, uh, you either don't know or you can't get the time for the actual EVA person to come and say, yeah, this tool is right or it's wrong or it doesn't work. So, so uh, I was assigned to be, to be the EVA tools rep. Hmm. Um, and I would go to meetings all over the center about these various tools that are being developed. And my job would be to be the voice of the crew office. And it's, it wasn't solely my opinion. I would, I would, if it was important enough, I would have to bring it back and get a consensus from the astronaut office. But that was, that was my job. We were, uh, we, we had representatives to the medical community and to the payloads and to the uh, uh, EVA and robotics and all this stuff. And so you had a job. You had a, I'll call it an engineering management job. So like maybe you're not the, you know, the last word on it, but it's someone that they can easily access to run something by. You're the belly button. Gotcha. You're the belly button. Right. Right. Here's the tool review. Who's going to go? Well, you're going to go because you're the EVA (laughs) tools uh, person. And it's your responsibility to understand it. And so that when the, when the tool gets used and somebody has a complaint, Hey, who approved this design? <laughs> right then, you're then you're on the hook. But so so uh, while you're waiting for a flight assignment, you are uh, you're doing a background level of training. So you're always in the pool once a month or so during doing uh, 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 EVA practice, or you're you're flying once a week, or you're you know you're you're in sims. Um, but you have a technical job to do. We're called technical jobs, and and as ask hands, you get these sort of engineering kind of manager kind of jobs. As you get more senior, you'll get a, a branch chief position where you have more responsibility uh, maintaining a staff, the, mm-hmm. the staff. Um, and uh, so you're, 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 uh, you're staffing the astronaut office. So the astronaut office has a voice in all the things that they're involved in that they're, that concerns them. Right. right. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So it, it's, it's, it can, it's sort of a nine to five job. I mean, it's sort of, you know, you have, you have these technical meetings, your week, First of all, you get this fantastic thing, which is a scheduler. Schedule, you, your schedule is given to you. That sounds so, like a superpower. Oh, it's fantastic. That's oh, awesome. <laughs> right? And so all the meetings that you have lined up are on your schedule, plus all the training and all the stuff. So you just, you know, on Monday morning, you get your schedule. Oh, here's what I got to do. Here's where I have to be. And uh, and uh, and so uh, the nice thing is you, not only do you, you know, do the meetings and the technical stuff, but the, the overhead – Astronaut stuff is fun. It's, you know, you get to go flying. You get to go, um, uh, you know, underwater. You, you get, you know, two hours of gym time, you know, uh, spread out a couple times. You, you know, you get that. Uh, it's assigned, you know, here's your, here's your gym time. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, I would say very few days are, are identical, um, uh, but it's all uh, pretty fun. So before you're even assigned to a flight, are you doing any kind of like specialized trainings? I know you went into EVA later. So like, were you already kind of like focusing more on EVA or is it just kind of like, hey, everyone gets a piece of EVA? Yeah, I was there at a break point. Uh, before I got there, uh, they, her- they, were, they were 
uh, uh, tailoring people to EVA or robotics or payloads, something like that. Mm. And, uh, and then they realized, I think, or uh, once station era was coming up, you needed, you, you needed uh, generalists. You needed everybody pretty good at everything. And so, yes, everybody went through uh, the EVA training. Everybody went through robotics training. Everybody uh, got payloads training. Um, I think it's, it was clear, it is clear that you know, some people are just better at one or the other uh, things. Um, but uh, to make it easier on the people putting the crews together, you don't want to be stuck with only, I, okay, I need an EVA, I need two EVA people, and here's my, the only six EVA people we got over here. You want to be able to, you want to be able to pick wide. So um, uh, in my era, uh, everybody went through the standard EVA um, uh, basic training. Um, and I think that, you know, I, you would get identified, I think, as a, as a likely candidate, but everybody would, everybody would have, would, would go through and, uh, try the attempt is to have everybody proficient at everything. That, that's the goal. Right, right. Uh, so, so one thing I'm curious about is I know that, um, you know, early on, and there's a number of, uh, attempts that eventually succeeded to capture satellites from the shuttle uh-huh. on these like really complex EVAs that kind of didn't turn out at all how expected. Yeah. They kind of inter- improvise on the fly. So I'm yeah. curious, like it seems like one of the big lessons learned from that was like, hey, whatever we're doing for this training is insufficient in some way. So I'm curious if you got to see any of the, uh, like the, those lessons being applied by the time you were training for it. Like, hey, you know, the one I can think of is, um, in fact, I think this was Lisa where they went to grab it and it moved away and they're yeah. like oh my god the, right the sim didn't do this it's like well yeah the sim didn't right. didn't right. have six off motion <laughs> right um i don't so the the fidelity of that kind of kind of training uh grew i think by the time we got there and uh we were never we were never pointed back we have this training because it, it wasn't sufficient right but um one of the fantastic labs at jsc um uh, gosh, now I'm trying to remember the name of the lab, uh, but it's a, a uh, 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 augmented reality lab. The product is called Doug, but they do they make the virtual fly around visual of the whole station inside and well outside certainly because you use it for EVA, and then they created uh, a force thing where. Um, uh, with pulleys and, and, and motors and servos, you can put a VR headset on. You could hold what looks like a satellite by by holding these, and you can you can pull it towards you. Oh, and wow. then your partner, who's sitting back to back for you, uh, the thing that he's holding is being pulled away from him, right? And so, and then they can they can make it. Uh, let's make it a three thousand pound uh, thing, so that it, it has the inertia of a certain. So so the mecha- the the, the Mathematically, they can make this thing feel like it's uh, fifty pounds or two thousand pounds. That's right? incredible. And so, and and yeah, it really is cool. It's really amazing. And so, and you can you can hold a handle and you can turn your hand and you can see through the VR headset you, your body yeah. t- being twisted around because you're you're less massive than the the thing you're holding. That's... So it's really cool. Um, uh, it's killing me now. I, I can't think of the name of the lab, but those guys were geniuses. And uh, they they this virtual reality stuff was really fantastic. This was this is uh, a, it's really complicated. It's uh, it's strings to around pulleys to servos, and so it, you can move it. You can move this thing, and it's made to do satellite capture that kind of stuff, yeah. or or EVA handling, where we're going to bring out an MBSU, a big box, and we're going to hand it off to each other, and then you're going to hold on, and I'm going to come around and grab it, and so you can you can practice it, really feel. What that feels like. So uh, I know the fidelity of that was was fantastic, and it did. I, I would, you know, my, from my memory, I, it, it really did feel like we were moving that thing around, and uh, it, it gave you that sense. Man, that's incredible. Oh, yeah, that's that's the greatest. The the lesson though, from like when I'm thinking of, of Lisa and the West Star Palapa, the, the the other the HS three seventy six rescue missions where the for on the MMU where he went. On the MMU, oh yeah, with the, the, capture, the, the stinger, stinger yeah. yeah, is I mean that my memory of that is a failure of um, interface testing, and uh, they thought they they built these tools, they thought and, and you know they thought it would they would work exactly, and and uh, for whatever reason, 
about Murphy's Law, it just doesn't. It doesn't fit right, or the thing is just out of tolerance, or the one that's used on the ground to make the tool isn't exactly like the one that's in orbit. And uh, and so I think the the what was learned there, or you know what what we take forward is you have to have a plan B and a plan C, probably a plan D, uh, because you think you've got a great plan A and something's going to happen, right? Got a great plan yeah. A, and then, right. you know, next day you've got three guys out in the payload bay, one, two, right. three, grab it. Right, yeah, <laughs> right, parental set, that's right, yeah, that's right. Uh, amazing, huh, they, they uh, uh, that three-way EVA. That was just wild. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, so, uh, is there anything you could say about, like, the early years in the job? What are some of the biggest surprises? Because, I mean, imagine you had a pretty good idea where you're getting into, but were there any aspects that really kind of caught you off guard in either a positive or a negative way? Let's see. So um, one of the things that uh, I remember is, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you become, you interview to be an astronaut. You get the interview and then you get it. Yeah. And you're, you feel like the king of the world. And, um, and you go down to Houston and I'm an astronaut. And you're not cocky. About it. Uh, trust me, you're not cocky about it. But you do realize you feel you're in the bu- in your bubble. Uh, you you it carries a lot of clout, and and you you forget that. Um, well, you forget that you're in Clear Lake in outside of Houston, where mm, you can't throw a you can't throw a dead cat without hitting an astronaut. Right. So so first of all, uh, you know your kid goes to school. My dad's an astronaut. Well, my dad's right, yeah, 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 right, right, right. And so uh, there, there was a there were moments of humility where either people don't care that you're an astronaut; it's not, it doesn't make a difference, um, uh, or it's almost embarrassing that you're an astronaut and you made this stupid mistake or whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah so, so it takes a little while to wear the astronaut suit uh, metaphorically right. and to feel the, the 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 to get the right level of because people love meeting an astronaut, so so you want to give you want to give people the pleasure that really will appreciate it. Like, oh, he's an I heard he's an astronaut. Oh yeah, you give them that, give them the pleasure of of meeting an astronaut. But you don't want to you don't want to brag about you you know you don't want to put it in people's face. Yeah. And so so I remember um, again that I'll, I'll say. How to how comfortable I I am in the astronaut suit, yeah. and how to um, how to walk the balance between uh, um, giving people the pleasure of meeting somebody that's you know going to fly in space or flew in space, um, uh, or or annoying people that you know oh here comes the astronaut right? right. So I remember that sort of as a something that I hadn't thought about that that you know you have to learn every and every. Each person has to learn their own style. Um, it's funny. I feel like before, you know, I would have been surprised or maybe confused by that answer. But now I've had the tiniest version of that, which people say, what do you do? I work at NASA. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah, go, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I can't imagine. Oh, I work at, Astro- I work at NASA, <laughs> but up there. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that's my general rule. And my kids know this, too. That when people ask me what I do, I, I, I'll start with I work at NASA. And then I... I I I like to have them ask me a couple questions in before I'll tell them about the astronaut thing because may, a they might not care but b if they really want to know that's fine but I I don't want to feel like I'm you know yeah you know. yeah so uh, so that was one sort of uh, little surprise or an adjustment um, I'm trying to think of the the you know I guess it's it sort of related you know I work. You, you come down now. You, all of a sudden, I work for the federal government, and the government comes with a lot of uh, paperwork and bureaucracies that that uh, you know it's famous for. And so, uh, you know, you you um, the, so even being an astronaut comes with a lot of administrative stuff that you just sort of forget that. Oh yeah, that's important. Uh, my favorite is the um, expense report that you fill out after you come back from space. And, uh, because it's a, it's a business trip. And yeah. so you fill out the expense report and, uh, and I've still got my expense reports for both, both my flights. And, and it says, you know, from 
traveled from uh, Houston to the Kennedy Space Flight Center on government air uh, because we got to fly T-38s. And then, you know, lodging is, is supplied, is provided because you get to stay in crew quarters and, and food is, is, is provided. And then, uh, and then Kennedy Space Center, Center to low Earth orbit on government transportation, <laughs> uh, meals provided, you know, lodging provided. And so that's kind of, uh, I, I, I hadn't thought about that, but I really enjoyed uh, the aspect of, yeah, it's just a business trip. And, uh, and administratively, it, it's treated just like a business trip. Uh, that actually leads to a, good, a, 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 leads to a listener question. Uh, Amanda B. asked, um, what percentage of the job is desk work? Uh, I, you know, well, you know, for astronauts, 99%, 95% of the job is on the ground uh, because you don't get to fly as much uh, as, as you would like. And then uh, of the time that you're on the ground, um, you look like a general engineer or manager, I would say, 50% of the time. So I would say 50% is, is, is desk work because you're at a meeting or you're doing, uh, you're answering emails, you're doing the stuff that, you know, workers, most jobs have to do. Uh, and the other 50% of the time, uh, you get to do uh, astronaut training kind of specific stuff. And that's... Uh, you know, we're really privileged to uh, working out as part of our job description. So going to the gym is, is work time, uh, flying T-38s, uh, doing robotics simulations. Or, or propelling down the side of an orbiter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Or, well, that's flight specific, yeah. Uh, the egress training. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I would say half the time you, you look like, especially if you're not assigned. Half the time is, is desk work. Once you're assigned a flight, then then you're then the job changes. Then you're all then it's all training. And, you know, you still have to do some administrative work, but but it's all training. All right. So uh, speaking of desk work, uh, one thing that I've noticed uh, is that a lot of NASA documents are pretty voluminous. Yeah. Uh, like for instance, I was looking over the generic shuttle flight rules, and it's like twenty two hundred pages yeah. long. So. Just put it bluntly, do you guys actually read through that? Are you expected to know it all or is expected to know how to navigate it quickly or, you know, how does that work? Yeah. So, well, so the, you know, that specifically the flight rules, which are every one of those flight rules has been negotiated and thought out. And, and if anybody reads them, they'll, what's really pleasurable about them is you read the rule and it, the rule is... There's some rule. And then there will be a justification and then backup text to explain how that decision was made. And if your life was so organized to have a set of rules that you could follow that as good as these flight rules, it would simplify a lot of your life. Yeah. Um, uh, so those, fortunately for the crew, crew is not expected to know any of the flight rules huh. because the ground does that. That's a ground job. The ground job is to make sure that we were running. they are running the flight per the flight rules. And so the flight directors are the really smart ones that have to know that back and forth. Interesting. The crew uh, is, is expected to know uh, how to operate the vehicle. And so, um, you know, there's a, sc- a sc- shuttle, it's called the SCOM, I can't remember what it was, but, but basically think of it as an owner's manual for the, for the space shuttle. And, um, and it's, a, it's your, it's our reference document for, uh, how the thing is wired, how the computers work, all that stuff. And we're supposed to understand that um, and so that when we are helping troubleshoot a, an issue, um, we understand how it works. But all those procedures, all of the procedures that we'd be expected to run have been uh, collated into a set of uh, flight procedures. And, and those are the ones we carry with us and uh, so the systems have been boiled down to a set of procedures, and we're supposed to know those procedures uh, very well so that when we get asked to run them, oh, Shuttle Crew Operations Manual, the SCOM, right, <laughs> right. And that's a big binder, um, and it's uh, every switch and every, not every wire. It's not, not, it's not to the engineering level, but it's to the user interface level. Um, and uh, um, so, but we all have our SCOM. Uh, at our desk, and, and something will come up, and we'll we'll pull it out and and uh, figure out what was going on, and what uh, you know, especially if there's a flight up and they're having a problem, and we'd all sort of research and figure out what, what what they should be doing. And I imagine that it's not like a matter of sitting down, like okay, I'm going to read through no. this. It's, you just kind of some issue comes up, and you've got day to day training, and piece yeah. by piece you fill it in. Right, right. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. Yeah. No, the geniuses there are the flight directors. They're the they are the geniuses. They know that they know that those machines inside and out and and the uh, and the rules to to operate them. And uh, it's really it's really amazing to watch them go through the flight rules and say you know forty seven J sub A. You know it says we're supposed to remove power, but you know and so it's it's really cool to watch them operate. Every once in a while, Wayne Hale will like one of my tweets, and it always makes my day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he, yeah, he's he's a he's a he's a great example of a really outstanding flight director. This question might be impossible, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. So, one thing I always hear about is a lot of the training is finding and balancing the strengths and weaknesses of a crew to kind of get like an overall well balanced crew. And I'm curious if it's even possible to quantify it. Like, what are some general strengths and weaknesses you see among the people you work with that you have to know, like, I, like I, I struggle to even ask the question because I'm not even sure what it would be like, oh, hey, this person's not good at, you know, this thing, but they're good at this other thing. Or, you know, what are some of the general skill sets that you have to develop that ha- the crew has to have in total? Yeah, so that's a, it's a great question and it, it's applicable to any team that you work with. So if you think of any, any group that you interact with a baseball team or a, or a hiking group or something. And, um, uh, and so as a, as a, I, I, so what I'm, what I'm thinking about now is cockpit crews because those are the, um, that's one example. That's, that's probably the most, uh, visible example of this teamwork. And so, um, you've got a commander, usually very experienced pilot, you know, very, uh, skilled and, and, and usually one flight maybe or, or for his first flight and then a couple of MS's in the back and the, the four of you have to uh, you know uh, launch and land and, and do everything that, that the pilot crew the, the cockpit crew has to do so <clears throat> it's it, rather than think of it as weaknesses and strengths you just I think of it as uh as you know, the personality of the crew, and, and like any high intensity group, you know that one person likes to work more quietly than uh, others, maybe. And so you learn that communicating with them, uh, talking to them, it has to. You've got to be precise, or you've got to think about it because they would prefer not to talk. Or you have one person that does like to talk, and and you you can see you know that they think better as they talk through the process. I like to say, I like to almost say everything I'm doing and everything I'm looking at. And so, um, that, that's my style. And, and so one of the reasons we practice over and over and over again is we are learning each other and learning, uh, what, so if, 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 uh, on my first flight, Linda was MS1, I was MS2 and, and, uh, usually, you know, Linda would be talking about the switches she's looking at, making sure that this is that. And if she's not, then I'm, you know, then I'm aware of either she's overloaded or, uh, you know, I, I'm just wondering that's not normal and I, I'm looking over. So I, I, I don't think of it as strengths and weaknesses or compensating. I think of them as we all have personality. We all have our different characteristics of how we work. And it, it's a pleasure to spend so much time practicing because you really get to understand the mechanism of your team and the peculiarities of of the mechanism that is your team and uh, uh, when to slap it on the side and when to shake it and um, and when to just leave it alone because it's gonna it's gonna do better if you just leave it alone um, I I rarely rarely thought uh, working with any crewmates that um, that that uh, you know, I wish they wouldn't do it differently or better or anything. It's, they NASA does a great job of selecting highly qualified people that are good operationally, and so it's just uh, you know finding everybody else, everybody's personality, and making sure uh, how to how to mesh with the the other personalities. So well, I'm glad I asked because that was a great answer. <laughs> uh, I realize we're going taking a little bit of time here, so I'll move on to some listener questions. Okay, uh, that hopefully maybe be sure. Quicker. Uh, Michael R. asks, uh, what's your best T-38 story? Well, what's my best T-38? First of all, flying in a T-38 is fantastic. I loved it. Uh, Coming from a single-engine prop background um, where you have to worry about uh, 
performance, it, the, the pleasure of moving a throttle up and watching your speed increase proportionally to the amount of throttle that you apply to it all the way up through three, 400 knots is just fantastic. So, um, uh, so learning how to fly. Okay. So, uh, you know, you get to fly with these really hotshot pilots, uh, and, and you're, we are backseaters. We mission specialists in general are backseaters. And so, and, um, uh, some are learning to fly for the very first time. And me, I had a couple hundred hours as a, as a, as a private pilot. So I had some knowledge of how to, how to fly, but, uh, pretty soon, pretty early, what, one of the things you get to do is you get to fly formation, which is cool. And, uh, and so you're, you know, you're going out to El Paso, which is a straight line flight. Um, and there's two of you, maybe three of you, but usually two, two planes. And, and, uh, and for fun, you'll go in formation. You'll go, let's just go formation. So sometimes they'll split. And they'll, they'll just, they don't have to worry about each other. Right. Sometimes that's going formation. Okay, great. You lead, I'll, you lead out, I'll lead back. Okay, great. And, uh, and so, uh, I was, we were, I remember flying wing and, uh, and so, uh, we're at, we're at cruise. So we're, we're, you know, we're 38,000 and we're just going straight out to El Paso and, uh, pilots i'm not flying i'm doing all the nav and stuff but and the pilots we're on not fingertip which is you know six feet away but we're you know 20 feet away uh pretty close um and uh and and uh my front seat pilot goes uh okay you you want to take it i go yeah i'll take it all right he goes okay your plane and the moment he says your plane the the lead decides that he's going to go up and then faster, and then slow down, and go down, and and I'm going. This is not fair. Like, how did, first of all, how did he know that the moment that that I'm going to get the plane for him to, for to speed up? Well, of course, it's not. It's that I'm supposed to control. You know, I, I'm. It's my job to control uh, the airplane to be in formation with the the other one, and it is much harder than you would think. And it, the moment it, it was. It, so what I course realize much much later is that you know the pilot is making uh continuous changes to throttle and to stick to stay what looks like stationary to the to the lead and uh, as soon as he said okay your airplane he of course stopped making those adjustments and what when you don't make those adjustments you're all over the place and so all of a sudden the guy's 200 feet in front of me. So I speed up and then shoo, I overtake him. And of course you can hear him laughing. You can hear the lead pilot laughing because the new guy is trying to fly formation. Uh, really, really hard. So, so you think about that and we're at, uh, at you know, at, at, again, probably maybe 50 feet tip to tip, you know, uh, and, and you, you, the technique is you look, have you, have, you have a piece of your windshield and you try to line up your piece of the windshield with, with some air part of, the, the lead airplane and, mm-hmm. and, and you start to learn how to jockey the throttles. And I never got really good at it, but I got competent, but it's hard work. But then, then you look at like the blue angels yeah. and they're flying three feet apart yeah, and eight of them or six of them yeah. and upside down yeah. and doing barrel rolls. And it gives you an appreciation for how hard that is. And, uh, uh, and to, to like, Oh my goodness, if I had to turn, because now, you know, the whole idea of formation is that you act as one body. And so, uh, especially if there's bad weather. And so if you get in the clouds, you, your job is to keep your eye on the, on the lead. And then there might be somebody on you. Yeah. And, uh, and so if you're turning, uh, doing a turn to, to, to get lined up with the runway or something, uh, I, anyway, uh, my, my appreciation for the skill of these military pilots, uh, grew exponentially, but. Uh, the, the funny story that I remember is thinking, how did that pilot, how did the lead pilot know to speed up as soon as, <laughs> as soon as I got the airplane? That's not fair. <laughs> That's great. Um, Melanie H. asks, um, what training or guidance do you receive specifically towards speaking in an educational setting and leveling instruction for age groups? As in, not how to be a good public speaker, but anything to, on how to tailor what you say to what that specific audience can understand. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. The answer is we get none uh, other than the getting thrown in the deep end. Yeah. And um, I would say for, mo- for mo- almost all of us, uh, the real one of the real pleasures of the job is going out and talking to the public, especially kids. And it's really fun. And, uh, um, and 
uh, you know, we do get some media training and we get some public speaking training and we get some advice on how to put our story together, our slide deck together. Um, but, uh, the first time you go to speak to a class of eight year olds, that's the first time you've spoken to a class of eight year olds. And, uh, they don't have I, a VR sim. No, and you don't yeah, go they, to the pool. No, it's, it's <laughs> right. As frightening as it is, as death defying as it is. Um, and so, uh, so I can, I can only speak from my experience. I don't know what they do now. Maybe they do do some training now, but, uh, but you're right. You, and you learn early on when you start your speech that you've developed for adults and you are a minute and a half in, and you have eight-year-olds that are wiggling in their seats and not looking at you because uh, the things that you're saying are not appropriate or not to the level of an eight-year-old's interest, um, it becomes pretty clear to you uh, that that you, the message, that the level of your message has to change or the vehicle of your message has to change. And uh, and so uh, you're, it's very perceptive. A question. I don't think that uh, that. And I would also say that most of us get really good at it. Most of us get really good at going into a group of five year olds, and then and then ten minutes later to a group of uh, parents and teachers, and and being able to adjust uh, uh, how we convey the information differently, even though the information is largely the same. And so and it's a great it's a great question and. Uh, we struggle that with that in the NASA organization that I work with now, uh, because we reach out and we want to encourage and inspire uh, five-year-olds and uh, and uh, and and senior citizens, and we have to make sure we understand uh, and use the vocabulary and the uh, the the uh, f- f- the illusion uh, that's appropriate to our audience. Another question here from Michael R. asking, what are the EMU boots like? We hear so much about the gloves and little about the boots. Are they are the boots pretty normal aside from the pressure barrier? Are they heated or cool? Do your toes get cold? Why do they have heels? <laughs> well, that's quite that's that's a great question. Uh, the boots are, uh, as you say, sort of nondescript. Uh, they are they have to be a little bit tight because. Uh, we have interfaces where we can click our boots into a plate, and that gives us a stable platform to, I'll say, stand on, but that's, that ties us to structure. And so you, you want to be able to, you need to be able to maneuver the boots so it locks into these fittings, and then it stabilizes you. It has to be tight enough to stabilize you. In fact, uh, on the well, most recent episode I did, uh, Linda did an EVA around Mir and kept slipping out of, oh. the, of, the, of the restraint. On of the, the foot, foot restraint. restraint. Yeah, and I was there to like, oh, like we got to make the smaller boots taller. Ah, okay. So, uh, right, it's it, and that was not an APFR. Uh, that was maybe the old PFR. So I can't in the old mirror days, but but uh, now the in my time we had a real problem with the boots in that uh, you're right, they're not custom made certainly, and they're not form fit. Um, uh, and we had a couple of instances where a sock would get folded over or the fabric inside the boot would get folded over and then create a, a fold of fabric on the top of your foot, which starts out okay. And then at the end of two hours is excruciatingly painful. Hmm. And uh, there was a guy that uh, he almost wanted to quit his EV, go inside and, and fix it. So we went through a whole process of, of, uh, of putting on the boots specifically to pull out any fabric folds. Um, and so there was this downside of, okay, we thought these boots were going to be just basically almost one size fits all. I think they're two different sizes, two size fits all. Um, but, but because they're so sort of simple, uh, the, the unintended consequences is that the, 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 this fabric could fold over and your sock could get caught and stuff like that. Um, so why do they, uh, so why do you need them? Well, again, they are, they are a great, um, uh, restraint piece. If you can get a foot restraint uh, at your work site, uh, it's a great. Uh, it's so it's so uh, handy to click into this foot restraint, and then you get both your hands free. You can use your legs to swing back and forth. You can get closer to the work site when you want, or farther away. Um, so you do want them, uh, but 
but it's a good point. They're not. They're certainly not as custom as the gloves. I think there's just two sizes, and you, you get to pick the medium or the large. All right. Well, uh, one last or uh, simple question here. Uh, Josh W asks, uh, "What's your favorite Star Trek series?" And I will add on to it. Please explain why it's Deep Space Nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's my uh, uh, confession, which is not really a. Uh, not really at all a Star Trek fan. In fact, not really a science fiction fan. So uh, it's I'm I get embarrassed uh, and a little um, intimidated when we get into conversations about uh, science fiction. So I apologize. I have no favorite uh, uh, alien or character or episode. Sorry. Fair answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And one last thought here is uh, I asked a friend's five-year-old son, Ben, if he had any questions for an astronaut. And he thought for a second, and he said, and this was, I asked him last Saturday, he said, Happy New Year. Oh, so I thought I would pass that along. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And there we have it. What better way to wrap up than with a Happy New Year from a five-year-old at the end of February? As always, it was an absolute blast talking to Dan and getting to pick his brain about the minutia of astronaut life. Believe it or not, I actually have one last question that I forgot to ask Dan when we met, so I followed up via email. I asked, how did the sardines get their name? Dan wrote back, so we were named the sardines, the name is given by the most recent class, because we were 44 strong, 35 US and 9 internationals, that then had to squeeze into the offices on the 6th floor of building 4S, the astronaut floor at JSC. We were squeezed in like sardines. We embrace the name. We have patches, a logo, etc. <laughs> so there you go. Thanks again, Dan. If you're not sick of me yet, you can count on another interview request when we get to STS-108, if not sooner. Next time, what does a Coca-Cola machine, space hab, an inflatable antenna experiment, and space shuttle endeavor all have in common? I have no idea. I haven't done the reading yet. But they all work into STS-77 somehow. So tune in next time and we'll find out together. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. Pass.